Uh, so this is the I'm a Practicing Musician podcast, and I'm your host, Jake Douglas, founder of Practicing Musician. And today I've got a good friend of mine of 11 years uh, with me, Rory Cray. Thanks for joining me, Rory. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm glad to be on this podcast and, you know, sharing why I love music. Yeah, great. And we've been working together on and off in various projects for the entire time. In fact, we met by playing music. Uh, do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about that experience? Yeah. So um, my buddy Andrew Aguilar, who's now in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, we met in fifth grade. And uh, after I got a guitar, started playing guitar in about uh, eighth grade. He found out about it and he's like, hey, Rory, I need someone for the talent show. You're going to be the guitarist, right? And I'm like, uh, okay, I guess. He's like, don't worry, it's it's really simple. And so, you know, learning guitar, it was, it was pretty simple. And uh, I just stuck with it. Um, so it was just me and Andrew for years and years going through various rhythm guitarists, drummers, um, and whatnot. And uh, I think it was, well, a little after high school, we were starting college and we needed a new drummer. And Andrew's like, hey, we I found a guy uh, in Shoreline. You know, he was going to Shoreline Community College and I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. You know, let's, let's see what he's got. Um, so that was you with, I think, I think you still had the ponytail at the time. <laughs> <It's gone. laughs> no yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> um, but yeah, you know, it was, it was you, me, Andrew and Joe Pepe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, we played for a little while and I think one or two shows. Uh, and then we sort of disbanded and um, did our own things for a while. But uh, yeah, then you reached out to me again because when we practiced at your house in Seattle, you talked about these different ideas you had, including a music education company. We're like, oh, okay, cool. Um, but uh, what happened is, you know, you and I stayed in touch and then I got involved with the notation editing a little bit and then uh, did my own thing for a while. And then we reconnected when, uh, oh gosh, I forget exactly, but around 2019, you and I started meeting regularly, mm -hmm. working on then other projects, which turned into more projects. <laughs> and yep. here we are um mm -hmm. yeah that was great and uh yeah the 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 name of the band that we were in back in 2013 was beyond gravity that was fun we played a few shows uh and yeah i mean joe and andrew are both still playing professionally as well so uh there's a solid group of musicians back then that has just expanded in our skill sets and interests since that time so um yeah i mean d during that time you've been you just finished school 11 years later so talk to me a little bit about and talk to the okay. audience a little bit about what exactly you decided to do with your career path yeah so getting into college i went to western washington university in bellingham washington and i started out wanting to get into composition because you know Andrew and I we were a really good duo when it came to songwriting and um I was thinking man you know I'm gonna learn the composition chops and then translate that to the band because classical and everything learning all the ins and outs would you know expand my knowledge and capabilities for songwriting and that's sort of went uh, south a little bit and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to do a, a BA. Uh, and then, uh, then it turned into classical guitar performance bachelors. And I really enjoyed that working under David Feingold. 
And uh, after, you know, getting to the end of my bachelor's, I then was thinking about, okay, what am I going to do after this? And I was very interested in music theory and guitarists, they understand there's just a very common trend that guitarists understand theory really well because we we have really good pattern recognition when it comes to the keyboard or the the fretboard and it just sort of clicks a lot easier because of like the visual and physical aspects on the fretboard itself and so i applied to a few places for music theory but i wasn't uh, a composer uh, that was actively writing classical pieces and I didn't have other sort of credentials to prove on paper that, you know, it would be good to get into masters, even though I really enjoyed it. And one of, well, the, the only musicologist at WWU, uh, Dr. Bertel Van Boer, he's like, Hey, we're starting up a new master's program in music history and literature and we talked it over a little bit and i was thinking oh my gosh okay so he he told me that i can incorporate theory but also music history into whatever i uh, research and analyze and and whatnot whereas music theory it really just focuses on the theory and it can get really complex whereas music history it it encompasses everything um a bit more broadly and then to the cultural level so i got uh into that after a year of post back so i graduated with my bachelor's in 2016 2017 i learned uh well i took five different classes with dr patty bourne who runs the education uh, music education department at ww and oh my gosh talk about a, a passionate person. It was, it was just so much fun learning uh, from her how to teach K through 12 and different things like that. And that was also around the time I started working at Guitar Center because I graduated with my bachelor's and then almost immediately after started working at Guitar Center, teaching guitar and ukulele. And so after a year of learning how to teach and teaching uh, virtually, uh, I think five or six days a week, I just found a big passion for teaching music. And then I started my master's in music history and literature in 2017. Uh, yeah. And did that for two years. I wrote on the Beatles and this bookshelf right here, that's all Beatles right there. And my master's thesis is right there. Uh, rhythmic structure and style characteristics in the medium of the Beatles. So I incorporated a lot of music theory into that, but also the, the cultural aspects and the history around the Beatles. And I, I tracked different periods of their development and found trends. So that just was so much fun. <laughs> and around that time, uh, Dr. Van Boer, he, you know, being a, an amazing scholar of the 18th century, uh, specifically Joseph Martin Krauss, but also just the classical period in general, he said, okay, with your interest in X, Y, Z, I think you'd be an excellent fit at Florida State University. I was like, I have not heard of them. Um, well, I had obviously heard of the school, but not really the musicology department. And since he was born there and knew a lot of 18th century scholars that uh, are from there or work there, then I, I was thinking, okay, I'll, I'll try that out. And I, the more I learned about it, the more interested I was uh, for that program. And I just found that the musicology department there and their, their idea of musicology is like capital M italicized musicology, uh, which is not only the historical side, you know, think of all the dead composers from Europe. <laughs> um, that's the, the traditional 
understanding of Western art music. So that's the more historical musicology understanding. And then there's ethnomusicology, which is more of the living composers across the world. So FSU, they have big M musicology that encompasses just everything. So it could be live, more classical art music or Western art music, uh, contemporaries or, uh, you know, music, uh, from all over. I had, I had, uh, colleagues who are from uh, Nigeria, Zambia, um, like all, all these different places, um, like uh, even Hong Kong and um, yeah, a Balinese uh, cohort uh, colleague, Indra, he's, he's great. Anyway, um, so then I, I applied there and that was my dream school after learning about it because everyone got along and what they focused on was teaching. Because when you get into a doctoral program, program, a lot of different universities, especially Ivy League, they focus on research and they don't have the doctoral uh, students and candidates really teaching in the sense of you are the professor, you create everything. You're just given your material and then you teach it. And then you help big name musicologists work on research projects. So FSU, on the other hand, they say, okay, you create the syllabus, you teach the classes, you make the lessons plans, you grade the work, or you have a TA to grade the work and you oversee their responsibilities. So you're basically a professor. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that I really wanted because I really enjoyed teaching. I had about 20 students a week at Guitar Center and I just enjoyed teaching so much. So I was like, okay, I'm in this for the long haul. I, I want to do this. This is my mission in life is to teach others about music and just share my passion for uh, all of the possibilities of music. There's just so many avenues to get into. Uh, so then learning about music history and music theory and teaching that just opens up so many opportunities for understanding and teaching and, and things like that. So yeah, at FSU, I learned about ethnomusicology uh, and took some classes, seminars in that, like on Brazil with uh, Patty League and uh, just classes all over about, well, about music all over the world and across time. Mm -hmm. So after a while in September, actually, yeah, September of 2020, I decided to write about an early 19th century opera, which was just published on ProQuest two days ago. It's 419 pages. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun, which um, is, I think, very important when, you know, getting into a research project or, or anything like that. You should have fun. And then the hard work is still hard work, but it's that much more fulfilling when you complete it. Mm -hmm. So with... My dissertation, for example, it's not only something I really enjoyed writing and researching, but what's going to happen is that the opera I analyzed that premiered in 1804 and revised for 1811, the opera uh, is, well, currently the only available content for that is in manuscript. So the handwritten score that Fogler wrote and then someone copied out. And that's not really good for modern performances because it's all handwritten, there are mistakes, uh, then how do you break it into parts? So what I did is I just transcribed all of it in full score <laughs> just because I wanted to hear it. And so then I 
knew the opera intimately because I literally typed out every single note for every single instrument and it's 490 some pages in PDF right now. But what's going to happen is I'm going to get that published and then I already have someone in Germany who's very interested in having this performed because he's one of the very few scholars who even knows about the opera. <laughs> so I was passionate about this, uh, this early 19th century figure, Georg Joseph Vogler, and then found this really interesting opera, Samori, that represents Indian culture, like India. Uh, Madurai is the, the setting of the opera, and then that just sort of blossomed into this enormous dissertation and, you know, uh, performance in most likely a few years. So then I finally graduated with my doctorate December 15th of 23, which is a little over a month now. So um, it's, it's a nice ring to hear, you know, Dr. Cray. I'm like, oh, yes. Yeah. that's that's true <laughs> you've earned it you've earned it that's an 11 a 10 10 11 year journey in higher education yep nice and yeah the uh i i saw the digital version i'm gonna read it once i get the physical copy because i stare at screens all day and it's uh 400 pages so i <laughs> wait till i have it in my hand so i can take a break from looking at this uh, electronic machine here but i did thumb thumb through it, I guess, metaphorically, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> saw how uh, detailed it is and all of the different diagrams and different images and different uh, passages and whatnot. And then, yeah, it's it's a very incredible feat to have accomplished that. And I'm looking forward to not, not only reading it from a standpoint of learning about the opera, but especially from the framework that you created for your dissertation, which when I was talking with our chief education officer, Dr. Frederick Burrock, he mentioned that most people when writing dissertations choose a framework which already exists, but you actually went and created your own. Uh, you want to talk about that for a minute? Yeah, or <laughs> several minutes. Several minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very, it's an important cultural framework in my opinion. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the inception or the, the beginning of this framework really came out of trying to understand the opera Samori by Fogler. And what is so distinct about the opera is that it's representing a culture from India in a way that I have not seen prior to the opera and, or even after to the degree that uh, this opera represented a non-European uh, culture. So what happened is that Vogler collaborated with Franz Xaver Huber uh, to write the libretto. So Huber wrote the libretto to Samori and what inspired him was there's a small sort of movement of German intellectuals interested in Indian culture. And at the time, you have uh, figures like uh, Sir William Jones, who translated a lot of Sanskrit into English. And then those works were translated into numerous languages, uh, including uh, Johann Gottfried Herder, who read the German translation of Shakuntala and was absolutely blown away by the beauty and depth of Indian culture. And not only with the this fourth century drama, but with the, the Vedas, like all these different works of poetry and uh and you know, you name it. So Huber the librettist to Samori, he read all of these different accounts and uh, different sources on Indian culture and thought, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to incorporate 
different parts from these travelogues and other sources to then write this opera of Saint-Marie. And I knew he did that because at the end of the libretto of Saint-Marie, there's these explanatory notes, or Anmarkungen in German. And there are 22 concepts and terms that reference Indian culture in different ways. Like in Indian wedding practices, there's a thing with bridal gifts. Or if you don't show up to the wedding and you're invited, then you're an enemy. <laughs> you know, things like that. Or what's the, the homan or homa? Uh, like who is Shiva? What is a lotus flower? What's an antelope? <laughs> you know, all these different aspects of Indian culture. Whereas, and I have this big preamble, because... Uh, yeah, whereas like other operas of the time, they just saw another culture and said, oh, I'm going to ornament the opera by adding this, this Turkish character, or this Indian character, or Chinese, or like whatever other non-European culture in a stereotypical way. Very uninformed, stereotyping the music, and it's... Uh, something that wouldn't really fly nowadays. We call Whereas, that a <laughs> oh, yeah, there's, yeah, <clears throat> yeah there, there's all sorts of implications of appropriation, and it's just not really being respectful, let's just say, to yeah, the yeah. other culture. So with Samari, it was so distinct because it's referencing these mm -hmm. cultural artifacts mm -hmm. that reference... Indian culture based on travelogues of men, you know, still European men who actually went to India, spoke the languages, and heard uh, from the natives in these different cities and geographical regions, wrote down what these actual Indian people said, and they wrote down what they saw. So to an early 19th century audience member that's like, wow, this is quite accurate uh, because it's actually referencing a source. Uh, so this is very early, uh, early like anthropology, like all, all these different uh, fields that were really burgeoning um, late 18th, early 19th century. So since somebody was so distinct, I was thinking, okay, with all the current frameworks, it really focuses on something like musical exoticism. And there, there's a really big scholar, Ralph P. Locke, and his book right here, Musical Exoticism, is a seminal work in that field. But with that, it seemed a bit limited because of his case studies not including anything like Samari. And not that, you know, there aren't aren't any. He just didn't find any because it's just so rare. <laughs> um <clears throat> so I was thinking, okay, this is this is a good place to start, but it's not anything that I can just build from by using it exclusively. So I obviously borrow from that and from other theories, interdisciplinary approach to then create what um, I call the intercultural positionality framework or IPF for short. So the intercultural being the you know interactions, um, and I won't get into the, the pedantic aspects of it, but it's thinking about culture in the sense of there are the cultures within your areas. You know, the culture of Seattle is different from where I am in Sandpoint, Idaho, which is different than Atlanta, Georgia, or, you know, Austin, Texas, or uh, Mobile, Alabama. You know, there are different cultures within, let's say, America that are different uh, from city to city, state to state. Mm -hmm. And then you have different cultures that don't speak the same languages as their primary language, like you, you go to Madurai nowadays, 
or Beijing or um, like all these different places across the world, that's a bit more different than what you have within your uh, geographical location, usually. So then that's the intercultural. And then there's the positionality, which is basically just how do you position yourself amongst or uh, against others. So for example, uh, I am a, a uh, musicologist that, you know, I put myself in that position because I, I am one <laughs> um, and other identifiers. So I identify as X, Y, and Z, and that's how I position myself. And that's how I'm perceived um, usually. And so it's the IPF or intercultural positionality framework then uses three frames of reference to understand, try to understand a work person, uh, you name it, which is positionality, which is uh, looking at the person who created, let's say, Samori, Georg Joseph uh, Fogler, and Huber, composer, librettist. And I look at their positionality um, throughout time and how they are positioned when Samori was written. 1803, premiered 1804, revised 1811. And then the second frame, so you have positionality, second frame is the views of the self and others. Mm. So at the time, without getting into too much of what self and other means in this dissertation and framework, is that Vogler, he was a German self-identified and just quintessentially German. And so that has a lot of implications. So that's what he calls like the self, or that that's how I classify the self within the dissertation. Whereas the other is the Indian identity. So in Samori, there are no Europeans. All the characters are from India and takes place in Madurai but there's like Tanjur and like all these other locations that it references. So there's the self and the other that then has implications when you analyze the opera. And then the third frame is the representations of the self and the other. So these are heuristics to really get to the depths or the, the meaning of the opera possible motivations, intentions, and things like that, because uh, that's basically how we view the world. You know, based on who we are, we view things based on our experiences and have certain prejudice or certain ideas or assumptions about, you know, anything that you you look at. But in this case, it's, it's a, a people uh, like yourself or your fellow Germans or people from India. And then how you represent that, opera being a very great example because it's it uses all the modes of communication from visual to auditory. And then you represent yourself and others in particular ways. So it, it uses all these threads to really get to the, or try to get to the roots of understanding what, what he was intending uh, with this more, quote unquote, accurate representation based on uh, authoritative sources and how that then really um, comes out to the audience and how it's received and so on. So the IPF, Intercultural Positionality Framework, can then be used for many other things, which my committee during my defense said, uh, that it's quite applicable to textbooks, to teaching, you name it. So I've been developing it a little bit further because obviously I created it for one specific purpose for the dissertation, but I, I'm expanding it for other purposes to better understand the world, but also help others understand the world by using 
these heuristics or just ways of understanding, like a path to understanding uh, themselves and their place in the world. So you can apply this to uh, just understanding like, okay, who am I? And how do I view X, Y, Z? And how do I represent X, Y, Z based on my past, my understanding of myself or, or these other cultures? Like, oh, okay, I, I don't know much about India or uh, Hinduism, like all these different things. So what, like, what's my view on it? And what do I understand about it? What do I do? not understand about it and then how do i represent that when i talk with others or interact with people who understand it very well um, and then obviously politics would be a an obvious one <laughs> because talk about performance <laughs> um, you know in in the real world and you represent let's say the other side in a particular way by framing uh yourself or the other political party in particular ways. So then using this IPF, you can, you can say, oh, okay, they really know about what they're talking about, or they really don't know about, you know, what they're talking about. So it, it helps people understand without just um, having a knee jerk reaction with how they feel and just sticking to it. It's, it's more going to logic and reasoning rather than just me versus you. Like a, a poignant thing I, I was proud to write is like, okay, instead of us versus them, it's us and them. And that's, that's important because, you know, if there's a line in the sand or, you know, us and them or me and you, that's, that's totally fine but it's how you interact with them is is what really creates a bridge to understanding or uh, sort of blurring the lines when it comes to uh, trying to talk with and communicate and you know live with <laughs> all these people let's say you know in america it's it's quite divided right now so it's, it's like okay yeah i i understand that you have these different political leanings or beliefs, but it's okay. Like I, and I want to understand why you are where you are so I can, I can better understand, you know, us Americans and I can communicate with you better. And then when you have less animosity and uh, prejudice, like negative prejudice against someone else, then you can actually talk with people across the aisle and have better understanding to then maybe have them understand who you are in your position, your ideas about the world and what you find valuable. So if, you know, if people incorporate the IPF just, you know, positionality, views of the self and others and representations of the self and others, then you can try to understand yourself better and understand others so we can all communicate and get along uh, better, even if we don't believe in the same things. Yeah, I think that that's important. I would think that the, well, one of the issues is that there's a lot of people who don't want that to happen. Uh, I, on both sides of the aisle, I mean, any kind of group think taking to taken to the extreme leads to the necessity clear, uh, and just inherent necessity of having a leader, which then detracts from the whole ethos of that direction. Uh, and then the other direction is complete sovereignty, individual sovereignty, which then creates a hierarchy, which makes it very difficult to uh, get out of the bottom of that hierarchy. Uh, one of the best ways I've heard of e explaining the difference is that the the right is protects the hierarchy and the left protects those displaced by the hierarchy. So they're both necessary and the leaders, uh, I think it boils down to the 
uh, intentionality of the leaders and the the, posi the positionality of the leaders? Are they doing this to uh, to help and to understand, or are they doing this because they're trying to win? And even winning isn't necessarily a bad thing if the winning doesn't isn't doesn't come at the uh, maximal inequality or creating the maximal inequality, uh, which is currently what is attempting to have happen because you you need you do need the uh, competition and you need to reward people for different skill sets and whatnot. But I think that this leads really nicely to one of the next questions that I always ask people. Um, from your position, what does art mean to you? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's... It's a tough question. A, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sort of gets to uh, a very popular question within teaching music uh, in general, or just a lot of music classes, they say, you know, what is music? Um, and a, a great, uh, a great thing that I picked up and Dr. Van Boer said um, in a sort of like silly way, but it's like, oh, it has a lot of truth to it. Um, he said, you know, music is what I say it is. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's, that gets really deep. Um, and then that can get to art. You know, art is what I say it is. Uh, because you have uh, something like music and you hear, you know, uh, a tune that is being performed and you say, oh, okay, that's music. You go to a river or you, you go to the ocean, let's say, and you hear the, the waves crashing. And it's like, oh, that's, you know, that, that's a nice sound, but you wouldn't really call it music. Some people might say so, but then you listen to Yellow Submarine by the Beatles and you have these waves and you have this music and it's like, okay, that's, that's music. It's a part of the music. Mm -hmm. So in one context, it is art or music. In another context, it's just natural sounds. So this boils uh, down to, I suppose, the frequencies underlying all seemingly outward manifestations from color to sound to physical objects. It's all just some, some form of vibratory uh frequency that then turns into more or less dense and different sensations uh within our perception mm -hmm. which then gets to the very famous example four minutes 33 seconds by john cage oh, yeah, which that's... it's in three movements and each movement has one word it says tacit which means like, you know, just be quiet. <laughs> um, that's not the literal, but um, so then what it is, is it's a performance. And even though you're not instructed to play something, you're still listening. And, you know, the auditory and frequencies, like, you know, you, you'll hear like a, that washing machine or you hear AC if you're in a concert hall uh, very lightly, or you hear a car honking outside. Um, so it's it's the, the place and the intention of having this piece of art that is occurring. And that, that sort of gets to a moment that sort of opened my eyes it's sort of like a lowercase e enlightenment moment. Mm -hmm. And of all things, it was a YouTube video by the School of Life on the book In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust. And it's the longest novel ever written. And Proust spent years and years writing and writing and writing. And it's, it's semi- infinite jest. <laughs> way longer yeah uh, it's like 1.25 million words or something like that it's it's insane it's it's in like several volumes 
Um, yeah. That's almost as many words as Shakespeare wrote in his entire collection. <laughs> 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 yeah, interesting. Okay. Sorry, go on. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, yeah, so it's this, you know, learning about it, it's like, okay, how do you dive into a work like that? Because if you have this plot, like that's, that's just insanely long. Are there subplots? You know, how, how do I approach this? And this video, it, it really just summed up Proust's philosophy, which then reading at least part of it, I've only read the first volume and change. Um, cause I've, I've been in school for so long. I've had to read other things before I, you know, read, read something as, as, uh, dense as Proust because you read a sentence and it's like, oh my gosh, I need to think about this for half an hour. <laughs> um, it's just so beautiful and so much to get into, but the overlying philosophy uh, throughout the whole book, and sorry, spoiler alert, uh, kind of, is that Proust throughout these, you know, over 1 million words is trying to find the meaning of life or at least meaning in life. And so he tries different things, which is like status, because he's like, oh, these rich people and these circles, they must have it. Like they, they must know, you know, what, like what, what the magic thing is for fulfillment and beauty, mm -hmm. and things like that. And he gets into the circles and he's like, man, these people are so shallow and uh, just materialistic and they just care about appearances. There's no depth to them. And then he's like, okay, well, love you know love with another person that must be like the pinnacle of um of life and meaning and happiness universe and everything um and that doesn't work out uh though he does find you know some great things there so eventually then the does youtube video to, does he come to the response of 42 does that this is conclusion as well <laughs> no <laughs> that'd be funny this is like early 19th century um, yeah that, that'd that be hilarious like if you made like your own version at the end meaning to life 42. <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry um, <clears throat> and so the what the school of life video really gets to is that what proust realizes and what is then really reflected throughout the whole book that you can really connect with is that being an artist is how you can find a lot of meaning and value in life. And it doesn't mean like, you know, everyone should be a painter or a musician or anything like that, but what does art do? You know, so you have uh, sunflowers sitting on a table and you say, okay, that's pretty. But then you see Van Gogh's representation of a sunflower on a table and a lot of people they look at that and say that is absolutely gorgeous and they just stare at it for hours but they wouldn't you know they might not do that just regularly if they see sunflowers on a table but they they might also really like to see rembrandt's representation of sunflowers on a table i don't know if he ever did um, or goya you know you, you have all these artists who see something in real life and then they translate what they want to put into that object or whatever it is into that the object being a painting or image, whatever it is. So they're translating this into art. So what Proust is saying is, you know, you have your own sensory uh, understanding of the world and you can be an artist just by looking at the world around you. Everything is beautiful. So, so he has this gorgeous, gorgeous paragraph just on asparagus. He's talking about asparagus and the intricacies of the colors and how it, you know, flows and this and that in the um yeah it's it's just it's gorgeous it's like you know you you look at asparagus you know you steam it up and then you eat it um but 
what he would do is he would look at things up close and just like find the beauty in them. So you can find beauty everywhere and it's, you can be the artist by trying to find the beauty in everything that you see, interact with, um, and everything. Cause you know, my computer is on a table and it's made of wood Mm Yeah. Well, I think that that's a really important distinction that a lot of people don't realize because when we're looking at, when we're expecting somebody else to interpret the world around us, then we're detracting our own uh, ability to perceive that beauty is really what ends up happening. And so, so transitioning from You know, I always talk, I don't watch very much television. And when people ask me why, I'm like, well, because I'm, what I'm doing is I'm watching other people have fun. Why would I do that? <laughs> why, why wouldn't I just go and have fun? <laughs> you know, why, Right. why, why I don't listen to too much music anymore. I used to, but now I like, I listen, when I'm listening, I'm playing. When, whenever I'm actually doing something to, Like if I go on social media, which I don't do very often, but when I do, what I'm doing is searching for something new. So right now I'm into comedy. So I'm figuring out ways of uh, approaching the topic or the uh, art form of stand-up comedy. <clears throat> And so it's, it's like, okay, what are these types of frameworks? Because you have to understand some of the current ways that it's being done. So then you can break those rules. You have to have the form so that then you can reform into your own version, just like you have to have the sunflower on the table to be able to then draw your interpretation of the sunflower. But instead of creating an, uh, instead of viewing it as this other person is an artist and I'm not, it is no, everything is art. And if we are able to appreciate that, then, uh, I mean, it, it does open up a whole new level of uh, appreciation for everything that's around us. And it, I would almost go as far as to say that that's how you maintain the curiosity and wonder of a child throughout your life, which most people lose. And it's unfortunate. So, um, yeah, no, that's a great answer. So we, we have a few minutes left here. I've got a few more questions. Why then, I just, I guess, to my, a degree gave my response, but in your, from your position, uh, why is art so important to individuals and to our society? 
Mm. So to in why is art important to individuals and society? Yeah. I would say art is so many things because you can consume art in its various mediums for various purposes. Uh, one thing that one industry that never dies, no matter how good or bad the economy is, is entertainment. And entertainment is commodified art um, in a lot of ways. And, you know, you have the Great Depression. People still went to the theaters because they're trying to escape the bad reality um, of their daily lives for most of the, uh, let's say, Americans at the time. So they find art and they're escaping into something uh, that entertains them, that makes them a bit happy. Or why do we you know, listen to sad music after a breakup? <laughs> like you listen to something and then you start crying. Like why would you do something to intentionally cry? Um, like art, it, like it's cathartic. Uh, it can add a lot of meaning to the individual and really lean into certain feelings to eventually feel better. Um, in that case, you know, like a breakup or, or a tragic opera or something like that. And you can cry because it's so beautiful, but also because it makes you feel something. And yeah, for yeah, the sake of art, it can, it's, it's something that really adds to society culturally. And it's, it's some, it's the backbone of culture. It's the backbone of society because how boring would it be to be a bureaucrat that deals with just numbers and forms and bureaucracy all day. And then you go home and you eat a, a meal that only contains the necessary ingredients to sustain life. And then you, you go to bed because your body says you need to sleep Then you wake up and you do, do it again. It's like, okay, that's some people, I don't know if a lot of people would enjoy a life like that. you know, just staring at the wall. <laughs> um, but we, we need this sort of community uh, individually and societally to really get into, you know, all sorts of uh, aspects that art can really bring out, whether it be uh, catharsis or joy, um, you know, festivals of music or dance or, Um, visual arts, auditory, you know, we're, we're musicians, we love the live experience. And yeah, you can listen to a studio recording that's polished alone in your room and listen to that and find enjoyment. But you can also then listen to that same artist play it live and get a whole new experience because you're with other people. They, when they play it live, it's not going to sound the same as the studio. It, it's going to have these elements that are new and exciting. And it's, it's so interesting because you can, you can listen to this polished recording that, you know, spent hour, like, countless hours or just many, many hours to polish for virtually free. You can just go on the internet and go on YouTube and, oh, I listened to this piece. But then you spend hundreds of dollars to listen to that same artist less polished. You know, it's, it's when you watch a live performance, it's not going to be as polished as a recording because There's literal editing going on in the recording. So you watch, you spend hundreds of dollars to watch an unpolished performance. And 
on paper, that sounds weird, <laughs> but we do it because of what we get out of it. And what we get out of it is based on the person and, and everything, but it's, it's a very communal thing and you get a completely different experience in a live setting than you do in alone in your room, listening to over the here, your headphones. Mm -hmm. So art to the individual and society is it's connecting us and really finding a lot of meaning because we just enjoy art so much. It's, it's a cultural thing. It's, it's, it's what sustains us, I guess you could say. Well, that's probably, um, I mean, that's a, I, I think a really important point to take. What I'm hearing you say is largely how I've been thinking about building a, a business, which is um, all that I've done is identified and learned how to articulate a, my perception of a solution to a problem that a lot of people have. And as an artist, that's why you build a community. You, uh, there's the commodification of art, as you said, for entertainment, which provides the solution of reprieve from day-to-day -day life. And then there's the art for art's sake, which is no identifying these problems and articulating them through song, and then gathering a following of people who are like, oh, I believe that same thing. I just was never able to be uh turn that into uh or explain that to other people and this person gets me and it's like no these are actually parts of the human condition that mm -hmm. this person has identified uh based off of the cultural context right the intercultural like with their particular position and then perception of the world around them at that particular time in in history and then Uh, and then they've created, they've, you know, they're using music particularly as their framework to then portray that, which is really fascinating. I mean, I also believe that the, uh, the live music, I mean, we've had a lot of conversations about this. We could probably do a whole podcast on this, but we do have to get going. So there's two brief questions I'd like to ask before we go, mm -hmm. uh, which your last answer leads nicely to what are some of your most memorable moments on stage? And then what are some of your most humiliating moments on stage this is always an important question and we like to provide this information to uh aspiring musicians who might be afraid of getting on stage not see the ultimate benefits that they can have and also not see that the people who they idolize to a degree or look up to at least um all have had humiliating moments on stage so it's important mm -hmm. for them hear this from as many people as possible so yeah i'm interested in your answer yeah so one thing to know about me is that i'm naturally an introvert so uh, i you know i can thrive uh in various settings um but one thing that has well when i was younger really been difficult for me is to do things in front of others you know like public speaking was a huge <laughs> fear of mine or mm -hmm. you know performing um and things like that but somehow i just wanted to do that um even though it was one of my greatest fears um and i i just found this sort of joy in music that just pushed me to do more and more um, on the stage and eventually you know speaking in front of uh, over 100 students where I'm teaching the class and I, I my heart's racing because I'm excited to share my passion mm -hmm. um, for others so some of my most memorable moments is when <clears throat> I went from the group setting in performances because as an introvert it's easy to perform in a group 
because not all eyes are on you exclusively. It's just on a collective choir, let's say, or ensemble. So my one of my proudest moments and biggest moments for me, and were memorable in this case, is playing Cliffs of Dover by Eric Johnson. A tough song. <laughs> for, yeah. <laughs> um, for a talent show. Um, and it was, and I wrote this intro and then I, I just went into it just solo, no backing track or anything. Um, but I practiced so much and I, I made a deal with my dad to, to play it every day for him. Uh, so it's just like, you know, one, one person and I'd play alone and then I would always play, perform it in front of him. But you know, getting on stage with my Fender tube amp, which is right there, and my playing on my Fender Stratocaster, which is upstairs. Um, that was one of my most memorable moments, like ever, uh, because that that was like a huge step for me personally. And also when I was performing, I had a like, of an out-of-body experience, mm -hmm. um, which was so bizarre, um, where I was playing and I was watching myself play. It was, oh. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like there are, there are moments on stage that it, it, it's hard to really explain. Um, but it's just this otherworldly experience. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I, like, when I played the last note, I was just like, you can see in the recording, I just like look up and with a huge smile on my face. And that was, that was a really big moment. Um, or playing with Andrew on stage. Um, there are moments where you're, you're just so in the groove that you're just one sort of entity. Um, another thing that hard to explain where there was a mistake that was made on stage and this was at uh, Louis G's. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a mistake that happened, but we were so in tune with each other, pun intended, that we just knew what to do. It's like, we just did it. And there's there was no rehearsing that. It, it, it was like this improvisation that, sounded like more than scripted um like rehearsed but it's like we just knew what to do it was so bizarre that that sort of connection with another musician because we had played for years and years and years together so we just knew what to do mm -hmm. um and then yeah and then last one before i get into the the most like embarrassing or I forget the wording of that moments for, uh, but um, my senior recital at WW, when I played my, oh, like a huge set, it was, it was some uh, pieces that were imitating Brazilian music. I played Bach's Chacon. I played Leo Brower's guitar sonata. Then I finished with Giuliani's Rossiniana opus 119 um but the big moment for me was playing the chacon because the uh the year prior i had played the two previous movements um the saraband and the gig and my grandparents grandpa jim and grandma carol they came and grandpa jim his hearing was very bad even with the best hearing aids money could buy, still it'd be hard to talk with him in a crowded room. Mm. Whereas in the concert hall, it was just me, so he could hear it very well. And that was that was like a big moment to know that he could hear everything that I played. But then unfortunately he passed away um, before playing. Uh, I played my uh, senior recital. So it was the next movement after what I 
he had heard before. So I dedicated that Chacon performance to him. And oh, just thinking about it, tearing up a little bit, but um, it's in D minor and there's this major section, D major, and that that just, oh, it just sings so beautifully. And it was, it was hard not to like <laughs> break down while playing it because it was just such a beautiful piece, but also the, the memory of him and everything, it, it just sort of added to that, uh, the memory of him and everything. So that, you know, the live performance, it's way more valuable than any performance I did by myself in my room. Mm -hmm. So then that, that performance, especially that piece, it, it just so memorable. Uh, for me and meaningful as well. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean I didn't make any mistakes across, you know, along the way. Um, well, that performance I, I did very well, but um, over the years, there were a few moments where I, I was like, Ugh. <laughs> um, where I was in this jazz choir and I, you know, I'd, I'd play the, the chords and sometimes I would solo one thing I'm not very good at or at the time was uh improvising solos and I remember this one performance and it was a small one but I just felt so bad because I was playing in the wrong key <laughs> and um I I didn't like it was modulating and I was like I, I, I just sort of like froze up mentally and I just play, kept playing something and it sounded so bad. And we all just sort of, you know, we didn't show it in our faces, but I was thinking, gosh, <laughs> like just, uh, I, I'm just waiting for this to be over and, and try to noodling around to like try to make it sound good, but I knew it wasn't, but you just keep going. You don't show it. Um, and Uh, that's that's something that uh, was taught to me and I teach to my students is if you make a mistake, don't show it on your face. Yeah. Just keep going. And some like a lot of people in the audience, they won't know. But if you if you show them that that was a mistake, then they'll 100 percent know. <laughs> yes. um, and confidence is really important when performing, because even if you make a mistake, um, it can go really south and then you just sort of choke and, oh, and then it just like the performance stops or you just sort of, Oh, I had a little flub. And then I just, I, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to do better, you know, in my performance in the future, in the present now, and just sort of get rid of that. And so then it goes into like the rest of the performance and, you know, you're, you're confident in the rest of it. So not allowing mistakes to really, uh, take over. Yeah. Um, and I remember in, uh, playing at Louis G's, the, the lights went out one time and it's like guitar solo. Like Andrew's like play guitar solo <laughs> or, or something like that. He's like now Rory on guitar. And um, you know, when you're playing, you're like you move your hand and everything, but the lights went out and there were still lights over there, but I couldn't see the fretboard. <laughs> so I was like, ah, I was like trying to find where I was and then like try to uh, get something and then find my place. But that was sort of like embarrassing because um, like I, I just literally couldn't see where my hand was or where to play. Mm -hmm. Um you know, another non-rehearsed thing. But in that case, I was just, it's like, just unfortunate. <laughs> so that, it was embarrassing to me, but uh, people out in the crowd, they didn't really, um, they, well, they couldn't see me like showing <laughs> them that this was a mistake or I was making mistakes. Um, but once, you know, lights sort of, oh, oh, okay, now, now I'm here. And then, wing, you know, mm -hmm. go into the solo. So um, that was another embarrassing moment, at least for me. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing. I think it's important too for people to understand if you're looking to become a musician that uh, you 
build your way up. Like Rory mentioned, playing for one person in particular family who are typically forgiving. Um, you know, not everybody's family is forgiving, but typically. And then, uh, and then you build up coffee shops, just a few people, right? Then you go into a little bit, maybe a few dozen, then a few hundred. And so you build your confidence levels. And at every stage, I mean, I saw Radiohead at the White River Amphitheater and they messed up a song four times. They had to restart the song four times and it's Radiohead. <laughs> like, yeah. And it was like, oh man, well, I guess we got to start that over. And, it, and everybody was totally fine with it. So, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's something to just keep in mind of not letting that fear. That's one of the good things about art for me is, is overcoming the fear. Cause there's so, there's so it's such a comp music in particular. I don't know too much about visual arts. I'm not a visual artist and don't dance or do theater or anything, but for music, you're it's colorblind. So and I'm colorblind. So you don't want to see my art. My daughter who's eight is better than me <laughs> and, and <laughs> drawing and coloring already. So, but, uh, yeah, so I, I think that that's uh, it's really important for people to understand. And thank you for sharing all that. I wish that we had more time, but I do have to get to some other meetings right now. We're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to do this again. There's so much more that we can talk about, and um, I think thank you very much for being the first person to do this particular framework. It's just so that uh, Rory knows and the rest of our team knows. Actually, we didn't even go over this. So Rory is actually working at practicing musician now. Um, Full time, which is great, and uh, as the director of AI and education, so we'll definitely have to have you come back and talk about AI in music, which is not, uh, well, it there is some attempts at doing it, but not in a very uh, robust, I suppose, to use a completely overused term, um, but the uh, in a very robust way. So we have some great uh, ways of implementing it within our platform but uh also working on the new curriculum for concert band and for strings and taking what you were doing before with the music editing and going into a lot more depth with different content types and video creation and uh professional development and different things so i definitely want to have you come back and talk mm -hmm. about that. Uh, but this, thank you for being the first person to go through this set of questions. This is, uh, uh, as I started to say, this is the set of questions that I asked our original teachers. So we do have, <clears throat> I'm going to be using this model at least for a little while, talking with our team and then talking with other musicians uh, to make sure that we have as much different perspectives or different per positions going on the intercultural positionality framework into these types of questions that all aspiring musicians ask like why why am i inspired what does art mean uh what question that we didn't get to today which would be great at another time is what is the difference between art and craft which mm -hmm. is there's a, clearly a huge difference there there's also you brought up but we didn't talk about it what is the difference between art and entertainment as a commodity so these are definitely things that we should explore more but uh, for now thank you very much for joining me and uh i will see you at one o'clock for our ai meeting that's a very exciting <laughs> stuff so uh yeah. thing you want to close out with uh no just thanks for having me on as one of the first uh for the podcast um it's a wonderful discussion you know, like always, you know, I just talk for hours and hours. <laughs> we have been for over four years now, weekly. Yeah. Every, um, every Friday, we actually had two hour meetings every Friday, almost every Friday for four years. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I mean, and I think that's another important thing for people to understand that are dealing with fear of like these kinds of things. Rory, you mentioned that you're an introvert and the reality of introversion is it's like I'm introverted until there's something that I'm interested in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Then I'm very extroverted. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, it, so that's another reason to explore art, uh, learning expression, learning self-expression, learning how to express yourself and finding those things that you're interested in so that then you're able to come into an environment like this, be on a live stream to YouTube, say that you're introverted and yet talk for uh, over an hour, almost an hour and 15 <laughs> minutes. I almost didn't have to ask questions because you just, you're so passionate. So that that's great. Um, 
And so, yeah, thanks again. And I'll see you at one. Alrighty. <laughs> Thanks All again, right. Jake. Yes, I, I'll stop the live stream now. There we go.